pray like you really mean it. It's the only way it works. Moshe, it's the only way it works. And even then, you're not guaranteed, but at least you have a chance. Right? The world, it's called the Olam HaSheker. That's what it's called. And it is, every step of the way, right? Maran, almost Nifta, a year and a half ago. Right? Look how they tore apart his whole legacy. Right? Two sworn servants, and they tore apart his legacy. And the fighting that's going on there, now it looks like it's together. Right? We call it in English, Taurus Menor. You like that, huh? That's what it is. It's all Taurus Menor, the whole thing. The whole Yiddish guy today, you know, people, who show them all that. How are you? Right? Right? People have their own agendas. And they uh, start promoting what Hashem is all about. Right? Let me ask you a question. Uh, ask everyone the same question. When we think of Hashem, what do we think of? Right? This old guy with a beard, you know, some kind of funny hat or whatever the case is, like the sorting hat and the, uh, what's his name, uh, the Harry Potter books, whatever. <laughs> uh, you're sitting there, I mean, who is this guy, Hashem? So some guys have a certain uh, picture, an image of what Hashem should be. Or I heard someone say once, talking about the Holocaust, he says, uh, I would never accept an Hashem who disappeared from the Jews during the Holocaust. Shulam Aleichem, how are you? Right? Couldn't accept an Hashem who let the Holocaust happen. Right? Couldn't accept such an Hashem. Uh, so in other words, what you're telling me is that you are as smart as Hashem. You're even smarter because you know what's right and wrong. And not that God runs the show. You run the show. And God has to act according to the way you tell him to act. You can't let a Holocaust happen. You can't let the Arabs drive down the street or the road over here and shoot somebody. You can't let them do that. Yeah. You can't let them walk into a grocery store in France and shoot a few people. How can you allow that to happen? You did. You can't be the God that he was looking for. I mean, it's an image. People have an image. You shouldn't have anyone, any any, any other kim. Any. You should have no image. Right? You saw no pictures, you saw no image, you saw no nothing. Right? But people have these images. They think this is the human mind. And it's a, an incredible machine, the human mind. It's always thinking, it's always moving, it's always done. Yeah, you see? So, how are you supposed to know the truth? You're in this world. You can't see Hashem. You can maybe experience Him according to what you think Hashem is. <coughs> but is that Hashem? Right? And every day, like it or not, you're challenged. Every day, Hashem presents a love. Hashem presents a challenge to you. And that's what's going to be your whole lifetime, till 120. Then you'll find out the truth. So what's left for us to do is to ask Hashem to guide us and to do the right thing. So that whatever path you're on, Hashem, is this the right thing for me? Let me do it. If it's the wrong thing for me, then stop me from doing it. Whichever way you're going to do it, let me do the right thing. And you have to, if you check yourself every day, and this is why Rabbi Nezal speaks about his poidadus, if every day you're going to check yourself, you'll get it right. You will get it right. Could this be right? Could that be right? Whatever. Right? If you check yourself every day, you'll finally get it right. But that's what you're meant to do. You're meant to check yourself every day. You're meant to rush your last week's parsha. But Yom Hazer, 
בחודש השלישי ביחד בחודש, ביום הזה בו מדבר סיני. On that day they came to, on this day they came to Sinai. Rashi says grammatically you should have said ביום ההוא, on that day. What's ביום הזה? Rashi says every day it should be new. If every day it's supposed to be new, then every day you check yourself out. Is this right for today or not? And what happened yesterday is not going to be what's going to happen today, and what happened today is not going to be what's going to happen tomorrow. You're going to always have to go back and forth and check things out. <coughs> if you have a checking system, you'll make it. And you'll make it forever. It may not be right away. It may take a few weeks. Yeah. I mean, one of the most amazing stories in history is Mount Sinai, where 600,000 Jews, then you hear the women and children, you had a few million people, then with the Erev Rav and all that, right? And they go and they witness Hashem himself, Kavi Yochel, revealing himself at Sinai to Klal Yisrael, right? Hashem is here, right? Hashem is here, Hashem is there, Hashem is always everywhere there. He's all over. You can see Hashem. He came from four. Forty days later, they made a golden calf. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? <coughs> you saw Hashem. You were brought out. You saw ten plagues. You saw the splitting of the Red Sea. You see manna coming down every day. You go to the original Rolling Stone and you hit the thing and it comes out water, right? You got everything that's going on in life. Everything you see. Hashem appears to you. Forty days. And not only that, the Gemara says, Livavtini be Hashem says, You love me with one of your eyes? Because when you were receiving the Torah, you already thought about making the golden calf. You're there at Sinai, Hashem is there. How does this happen? You can't for a moment think that this is a normal thing. It's impossible to happen. Impossible. Did it happen? Yes. Why? Because every day there's a new Yetzirah, every day there's a new guy, man. there was a breast of a chassid, a shapsa, a breast of they called him. When Nachman Tulchina used to say to him, I'm jealous of you. Me, they call him Nachman Tulchina. You, they call him shapsa, breast of You're the real breast of And this shapsa was a shoemaker. He was a simple guy, whatever. He retired. And he used to get up chatzos, and he used to come to the breast of shul early in the morning. Now, uh, in the winter, that's no easy feat. Freezing cold, in Ukraine, in the middle of the winter, the guy is absolutely freezing. The guy is in his 80s, right? And he's there, 3 o'clock every morning in shul. Shabsa, how do you do it? He says, I'll tell you, I wake up, and it's freezing, and I don't want to get out of bed. But then I realize, who's talking to me to stay in bed at this hour? My aunt Sahar. He's as old as I am. He was born with me. Right? And he's on the job already. <laughs> he's already on the job. Right? He says, uh, he's on the job. i got to get on the job. So he came to shoot, 3 o'clock in the morning, freezing <laughs> cold. I got 80 years old. Trudged through that snow in the... Uh, and then the human of then is not the human of now with paved streets, if that means anything. <coughs> Every day is a challenge. Every day you wake up and wonder, what's, what's Hashem doing here? I was asked to speak about Eretz Israel, so I'll, I'll say this. It was the early 90s. The guy named Rabin was elected uh, prime minister. Right? And he was working overtime trying to give the Eretz Israel to the Arabs. Every day you wake up, they had English news at 7 o'clock in the morning. I don't know if they have it anymore. I just had to stop listening at that time. I just couldn't take it. And I stopped. Uh, did I have 7 o'clock news in the English anymore? No? Okay. So had, every day the guy was announcing, Rabin tried this, Rabin tried that, Rabin, Rabin this, Rabin this. I got sick. I said, Rabin, is this the way it's supposed to be? A Jew is taking Eretz Israel, giving away to the Arabs. What's going on? So, I wrote a book, This Land is My Land. Taking Rabbi Nachman's teachings about Eretz Israel, Kedusha's Eretz Israel, what Eretz Israel really means, what it was meant to be, and what it is now, and all this kind of stuff. 
I start off the book like this. I always uh, I like this. It's a beautiful scenario. Rashi says in the beginning of Bereshit, the first Rashi. The Torah should have started off with the mitzvahs of the Torah. But what then? Hashem is revealing the might of His works in order to give the Jews the, his, his land, the Nachal of the Goyim. This is a Medjush, by the way. It's the second piece in Medjush Rabbah. Gracious. But okay, Rashi brings it the first Rashi. So Rashi says that Hashem gave us the story of creation to start with to tell us that he created the world. And if the Goyim challenge you and ask you, why did you take the land? Why did you steal the land from us? Right? We don't hear that today anymore, do we? Right? <laughs> if we he says, you tell them that Hashem created the world. It's his. To whomever he wishes, he give. He gave it to the Goyim. They had it for a while, but he took it from them and he gave it to us. That's what Rashi says. Reb Nossin asked that same question. He says, okay, what is Rashi telling you? Says, it's great. I mean, it's really, think for a scenario, I put in this scenario. You're standing in the United Nations. You ever see that glass theater in New York? You ever see it? It's an amazing building. All glass, you know. It's called the Glass Theater. United Nations General Assembly. They have now, what, 180 nations? They have a couple of people that have an island or two, so they're a nation. Everyone's a nation today. 170, 180 nations. Comes along the Arab, the Palestinian. In those days, Arafat was still alive. We say, okay. He gets up there and he says, listen, the land is Palestine land. It belongs to us. What are these Jews doing there? Along come all the peace-seeking nations in the Middle East, Syria, Iraq, Sudan, Algeria, Libya, Yemen, right? They're all peace-seeking nations. And they second it. Yeah, it's Palestinian land. Well, along comes the Jewish ambassador, ambassador of Israel, of the entire Jewish nation. So the boy side, you have to understand, it's not that way. Hashem created the world. It's his. It belongs to him. To whomever he wishes, he's giving the land. Maybe it was Arab land at one time, but Hashem took it from you and he gave it to us. And if you don't believe me, here, look at Rashi. You know, you can imagine, what is Rashi telling you? What is Rashi trying to tell you that? Tell, 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 tell the guy. Right? <laughs> it would work if he believed it. Oh. Believe it. Reb Nossin says, he's not telling you, Rashi's not telling you to tell the Goyim. He's telling you to tell it to you. Do you believe the land is yours? Then the land is yours. You could say Hashem gave it to us. It's our land. It belongs to us and finish. If you don't believe it, then you're going to have this kitrug. You're going to have this plaintiff, this these complaints from the Goyim that the, you took away their land. Now, ask yourself a question. Anyone here live in Israel today? All right? And how many people here believe the land is theirs? And how many, that it's given to you by Hashem? And how many people here, some of them say it was captured by the Zionists? Okay. Most of them don't even believe that. A lot of them, especially the media, say that uh, we had no right taking away the land. <laughs> you have Israelis, Jews, who say that. And that's why we have all the problems we have in the country today. Right? You have these Goyim who sit in the Knesset. I'm not talking about the Arabs. <laughs> you have these Goyim who sit in the Knesset, and they tell you what Judaism is all about, and who is a Jew, and all they're the ones who tell you that this is what Judaism, this is what Eretz Israel is all about. That is the problem. Are there any questions on this? Feel free. I'm not afraid of the questions. Anyone have a question on that? How do we disabuse them of that? Oh, okay. Yeah, we're coming to that. I just want to know before I go further. How do you answer Rashi if like, Rashi says, Shem gave it to us now. 
So if they attack or take it away from us, it's okay, so it's the, it belongs to the Arabs now. And it doesn't say that it stops with the Yid. Quran from Asa doesn't say it stops there. Rashi says it stops with the Yid. And the Torah tells us that if we continue with the Torah, the land will remain ours. The Torah also tells us if we don't remain with the Torah, then we will be kicked out. Were we kicked out? Once, twice, right? And more times over the years, it's happened. There's a beautiful story with Rav Herzog, who was the first Rav in, uh, in Eretz Israel. Before the war, before the 48 war, when the England, English were leaving, right? He was an English citizen, and they said to him, Rabbi, come with us. Come with us. We'll protect you, you know, from England. You'll be safe there. And he said, we were told by our sages we will have two exiles. They occurred already. This time there's not going to be an exile after this. That's Emuna. That is Emuna because the 48 war, right, Israel was on the verge of extinction before it even became a state. All right? But that took Emunah to say, this is Eretz Israel, it's ours now. Now we're going to take it over. So, nothing to do with Sapa view or Zionist view or anti nothing to do with that. The Metzius is the Nevi'im, Yeshaya, Yemiah, Yecheskel. If you look them, you study them with Rashi, you'll find that Eretz Israel is being given over to the Jews before Mashiach comes. Prior to Mashiach's arrival, the people will return to the land, they will rebuild it, they will raise crops, they will raise cattle, and they will live in the land, and it will flourish. This is all before Mashiach comes. This is a Nevi'im. Nevi'im, you learn it with Rashi, you find it. This is what Eretz Israel is all about. It's there for us. It's given to us. It's ours, right? Now, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to keep it as Eretz Israel, Or are we going to turn it into a place that has nothing to do with Eretz Israel? And that is the problem that comes up where there are plenty of Yidin, Rahman, Lutzlan, Hashem, Shitzpiris. When they come to Eretz Israel. No, this is a land. It's a Jewish land, right? Whatever they want to call it. But where is the Jewishness? Where is the Koyach HaTorah? Where is the Koyach HaMitzvahs? Where do you have that? Right? Certainly you won't see it in the media. So where are you going to see it? And that's where the solution lies. That's where we are involved. <coughs> it's up to us. Us means it starts with me. I have a responsibility, and then every person has to say the same thing. And eventually it'll get out, and it's happening. It is happening, but it takes a while. All right? You have to have a lot of patience, right? Less than 155 in the Kutumaran, the Rebbe says over there, he speaks about patience, and he speaks about Eretz Yisrael. And he says you have to be able to have patience, you have to have desire and yearning and want to go to Eretz Israel, to be in Eretz Israel. You have to desire that Sadiqim should want to go to Eretz Israel, uh, but you have to have patience too. Patience, he describes like this. It's a beautiful muscle. He says, um, if you uh, take a seed, you want to plant some wheat, take some seeds, you go over to fertile ground and you plant the seed, good ground that'll grow it, uh, it'll take root and it'll grow right away if you go to a desert area a place to it it doesn't grow right? you plant as much as you want to plant it's just not going to grow right? the Gemara says emuna is the Zroy faith emuna is Zroy right why is that because I mean Rashi says the positive shot is that you have faith in Hashem that He's going to send the rain, He's going to help you, and the plant crops will grow. Why not? Otherwise, what are you working for? Right? You have faith that Hashem will come through with it. 
And Moon is the Seder, that's the Pasha to Peshat and Rashi. Fact remains that faith is something that grows. It grows on you. It grows in you. It's something that you put your koyach into a muna. I believe in Hashem, and I believe this is what's going to happen, and I believe Hashem is going to take care of us, Hashem is going to watch over us, Hashem is going to do what we can. You believe. If you have faith, then you'll see the growth. If you don't have faith, you won't see it. Okay? So the first step in getting them to disabuse their notions, right, is us having faith. Do you believe that Hashem promised us the land? Do you believe that the prophecies are coming true? Do you believe that this is the destiny of every Jew? Right? Then uh, you'll, uh, you, you'll, you're contributing to the growth of Eretz Israel, to the growth of the Jewish nation within the land of Eretz Israel, right? And you'll be contributing to the growth of what Eretz Israel stands for. What does Eretz Israel stand for? Right? The Gemara and Yuma, Gemara says that uh, there was a stone called the Evan Shesia, the foundation stone. Hashem first created this stone, and from this stone, it's called Shesia, Shemimenu Hushtat, the world was drawn forth from this stone. Okay? So that that stone is the first part of creation first uh, manifestation of creation, first manifestation of Hashem creating the world. Where is that stone located? Anyone know? <coughs> Just in front of the Kodesh Kodeshim, right, or under the Kodesh HaKadoshim, but it's there, it used to jut out a little bit in front of the Kodesh HaKadoshim, where the Kohen Godel used to put the uh, Ketaris on Yom Kippur. And that is the beginning of the entire world so that there's a little manifestation of Hashem we see the hand of Hashem in a lot of things that happened to us over the years, we see that but we don't see it completely we don't Shemimenu Hushtas the world was drawn forth from there so first came the Evish or let's call it the Beis HaMikdush right? from there came the rest of Eretz Israel different boundaries, north, south, it's spreading out, right? And then there are the borders of Eretz Israel in Pashas Masai, the Torah tells us clearly the borders of Eretz Israel. And then you have the rest of the world, okay? So what you have is when you want to find Hashem, if you want to find Him, and you should want to, right? You have the Evan Shesir. You have a certain locality where Hashem is there, and that's called the Beis HaMikdash. And then you have Eretz Yisrael, a land where Hashem was manifest, where the crops, when they grew, they were world famous, as they are today. The crops of Eretz Yisrael were world famous at that time. The Medrash has several stories. And the crops of Eretz Yisrael today, right? Because this is the land of Hashem, and this is where it all begins, and this is where it spreads out. Now, there's a <coughs> Medrash, Tsoifer Pene Da Mosak, Shira Shira. The Medrash says, I see the Yerushalayim, Shetispashet Ad Damasak. Yerushalayim will spread out until Damascus. When I was getting ready to move to Eretz Israel, this is in 75, right? I was in a store, a nice guy, a Holocaust survivor, a very Gishmaki guy. He says, you move into Eretz Israel? Where are you moving to? I said, where are you Yerushalayim? Where else? He says, uh, not everybody can live in Yerushalayim. So I told him this Medrash, right? <laughs> the Eretz Israel, Yerushalayim will spread out till the mass. So everyone's going to live in Yerushalayim. It's, okay. it's a question. Today, it's a, this is a different neighborhood. It'll all be that way. But then the Medrash goes further. The Sifri, that's the Medrash on the... Uh, Sefer Bamid Bedvarim from Reb Shimon Ben Yechoi, right? Rashi brings it a lot. Sifri says, "Asida Eretz Yisrael should tispashet b'chol ha'olam kulei." Eretz Yisrael will spread out through the entire world. Right? 
The entire world will be Eretz Yisrael. <coughs> what does this mean? He goes to Damascus. He goes. Eretz Yisrael was meant to reveal Hashem. The rest of Shmuel Anshin said once, uh, Eretz is from the word Rotze. I want. Eretz Yisrael, I want to be a Jew. Right? That's the Taish Eretz Yisrael. I want to be a Jew. Eretz. I have a Rotze to be a Jew. The call is that we want Hashem. Do we really want Hashem? So I'm going to look for Hashem. I'm going to search for Hashem. <coughs> Dovid Melech said, "Ad emtzam mokem Hashem until I find the place for Hashem." Zoyis minuchosi adayad. This is my place where I'm going to stay. The taich is that <coughs> a person has to want Hashem. He has to look for Hashem. It starts with the base of Mikdash. Okay, I don't have that, but it spreads out. It goes to the whole Eretz Israel. So that not just those couple of people who are, who look like they're the holy rollers, or rulers, or whatever they call them, and uh, they live in there, they look to Jewish kind. No. Every, uh, Hashem spreads to everyone. Everyone could partake of Hashem. Anyone, whoever he is. Eretz shows that. But right now it's limited, because as Rashi says, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Mechad. Anyone know what Rashi says on that person? Right? Shouldn't ask, just not a classroom, right? Right? Shema Yisrael. Here, the Am Yisrael. Hashem, Shahu Elokeinu, Hashem, who is our God, will one day be Hashem Echad, the God of everyone, of the entire world. And that's really what it's all about. God created the world. There was a limited amount of people that were privy to Hashem's existence. And as time went on, it began to spread. There was Avram, there was Yitzhak, there was Yaakov. They were Megaya Geirim, Rashi says, all of them. Right? They went down to Mitzrayim, but they stayed, remained Jews, even in Mitzrayim. They came out, the Erev Rav already tried to draw with them. They started growing, David Melech time. The kids, are, what it means is that every Jew has the possibility of being able to come close to Hashem. Every Jew at any given moment can come close to Hashem. What is holding him back? He doesn't see it, he doesn't realize, it's not manifest. Eretz Israel was made to manifest Hashem. We, by acting like Jews, right? Acting like Jews is what makes Eretz Israel come out. The Gemara in Yuma says, that the name of Hashem should become beloved because of you. Right? Ketzad, the person learns, he davens, he's honest in business, maybe we shouldn't say that, right? But he's honest in business and he does his business faithfully, right? So then the people say, ah, look what it means to be a religious Jew. He's honest. He's decent. He does it right. If they're not honest, they don't do it right. And they chase away Hashem. So who's at fault if something goes wrong? Is it the other guy or is it me? All right? Who is it? This is what Eretz Israel is telling us. You want me to show who I am, and Eretz Israel is showing us. Look at the crops that come up in Eretz Israel. Look at the delicious fruits and vegetables. I was here 50 years ago in Yeshiva. I got to tell you, there's a vast improvement. In, in, but then it was not long after the 48 war, and they were really working at that time to improve the agriculture and whatnot. But today, the fruits are world famous. The fruits, the vegetables, everything, all over the world, Israel. Right? Why? Because there is Hashem. People see it. They can't understand how Eretz Israel survives. They can't. I can't. I understand it because I know Hashem is watching over us. But how can you understand? You got a few hundred million Arabs around us, right? They're trying to kill us every single day. And uh, somehow we're still surviving. I once said in the Shia, this is, uh, show me a modern miracle. He said, very simple. Every day, 
And there are five, six million Jews that get up and they get dressed and they go out and do their with business, whatever it is. If it's business, if they're going to yeshiva, or school, if they're going out to, to work, their mother's taking care of, whatever it is. Every day there's a few million people that get up and go out to do their job despite the fact that we have a Knesset. Right? Right? If anyone knows what goes on in the Knesset, uh, as if they're, they're really a ruling body that takes care of the country and whatnot, it hasn't happened since. When I was here in Yeshiva in the early 60s, there was a, a meetings, what to do about the housing crisis. When I moved there in the 70s, they used to have meetings in the Knesset, what to do about the housing crisis. In the mid-80s, after the Lebanese war, Right? They had a lot of meetings then. What do we do now about the housing crisis? In the 90s, right? what do we do about the housing crisis? Sharon, at that time, became the housing minister. <coughs> so he built. He's one guy. If I had to say a school about him, he built. He says, over here, build, build here, build there. He built all over the country. You know, they took it down right after he uh, became prime minister. But uh, whatever. Uh, they're still arguing over what to do about the housing crisis. Right? So it's 50 years that I know of, I mean, uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, so it's not, uh, despite the fact that there's a Knesset, the, the people still live, they exist. Right? Because Hashem runs the country, not them. Right? Despite the fact that they try and do everything they you know. Okay? So true. Hmm? So true. It's so true. I'd like to see so you print true. that in, uh, in the IRS, right? Okay. Anyway. Whatever, whatever the story is, right, it's not going to happen with any of the guys out there or up there. I mean, I understand we have uh, elections in a few weeks, right, something like that, right? a couple of months, whatever it is now. Elections, again, I have nothing else to do. Take a few billion shekels of the people's hard-earned tax money, and of course, you know, you have to spend it and do whatever, promoting your, your platform. I mean, it's, a, it's really a... Keystone Cops, is that what they call them? No, there's something more than that. Right? You remember the Keystone Cops, right? You see that? It's, uh, it wasn't uh, not uh, that young, huh? Anyway, whatever the story is, you have these farces that take place every single day. Right? It, it was as if these people are running. It's not. It's only Hashem running the country. But you have to believe it. You have to plant it in your heart that there's only a God. And he's the one who's running everything. And he's the one who said at the end of time, it'll take place. I mean, you have the absurdity of the Arabs, whose whole mentality is to kill. That's what the nation is. Yishmoel, going back to the beginning of time, when Yishmoel first came about, Yodoy Bakoyel, Viyad Kol Bo, his hand will be in everybody, everybody will be in his hand, right? And it's uh, happening. He has nothing to offer the world. Take a look, Yishmoel. What does Yishmoel have to offer the world? Nothing. Only they sit on land that has a lot of oil. Right? On the other hand, they need everybody. They need everybody. And this is a standoff. Yishmoel on one side, the whole world on the other, and people put up with him. People put up. It's, it's a herd mentality. That's what it's called, a herd mentality. Well, people follow the leader, whatever the case is. You know, this uh, guy in Barak, you know, will go and bow down to the Arabs, or whatever the case is. I remember when he first became elected, he went to Cairo University. You remember that? Mm -hmm. right? You know what he said in Cairo University? We all know the great um, the contribution <laughs> of the Muslims to America. There was not a, one Muslim in America in those years. Didn't happen until 50 years ago, right? But the great, and the world follows it, right? Well, boy, sorry, our job is to reveal the truth. You're going to speak about it. You're going to put it in the papers. Nobody's going to listen to you. Nosson tells us right from the beginning. Rashi is telling us if you believe it, you believe it, then spread the belief. Speak to somebody that you know about Hashem, about the Torah, 
about Kedusha Eretz Yisrael. It was given. It's a gift to the uh, to the Jewish people. It's ours. It doesn't belong to them at all. Right? And that's it. You have to learn to be able to daven through Hashem and say, Hashem, I love you. I want you. you know, I don't know what's going on. I'm hurt. Look what's going on. He didn't get killed. He didn't get suffer. Right? They're suffering. They have illness. They have sickness. They have parnosa problems. They have... Daven. Daven to Hashem. If you daven to Hashem, there's only one reason why you do that. It's because you believe in Hashem that He could take care of the problem. Right? You're sick. Daven for Him. What are you going to daven for him? You're going to daven for him. A friend of mine asked me once. <coughs> he says, I daven for this person. I don't see any change in the reform. The Gemara says, Ain't filosa shalodam nishmas. It's Gemara and Tainus. A person's tefila is not listened to. Elim came mesim nafshoi b'chapoi. Unless he puts his soul into his hand. You know, he really puts it in forcefully putting all his koyach and strength into the davening, that he's really davening to Hashem, that means that he really believes that Hashem could take care of the problem. All right? Did you ever daven that way? Yeah? Did it happen? It worked? See that? There you go. Okay? And that's what Reb Nosen says about that. Unless you really put your koyachas into davening, you're never really going to know how powerful you really are. How much you could really affect the world? You're one, there's seven billion, doesn't matter. You could affect the world. Moshe Rabbeinu, when he had to protect the Jews, when they made the golden calf, he said, I mean, that's it. It's, 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 not, it's not a choice here, Hashem. You have to protect. He put his soul, his whole life into that, and he saved the Jews. That means he saved the world, because the whole world was saved given for the Torah. If not that, the Torah wouldn't have been given, the world would have gone to pop. I, uh, should I tell the story? I was 16 and change. It was 1962, a little bit after the Cuban crisis, if anyone here remembers that far back, right? When the Cubans had missiles, nuclear missiles aimed at the United States, it was a whole showdown. Eventually they pulled back. I was a brazen kid, I was 15 at the time, <coughs> and I started thinking, Gewalt, here Mashiach was about to come, <laughs> and what would have happened if he would have come and I would not have had the schus of being in Eretz Israel at the time? I would be missing that mitzvah. Mashiach would have to gather me and bring me, like I, I didn't do it myself. <coughs> So I started thinking ways how I can go to Eretz Israel, a 15-year-old kid. This is 1962. It's not 2010 with every kid, uh, Boychik or whatever, it doesn't matter how old he is. is <coughs> right? Six-year-old kids come here back and forth like nothing, right? Those days, it didn't happen. Either you had a lot of money. The ticket then was five, six, hundred dollars which is today, six, seven thousand, eight thousand dollars $8,000, right? Sure. That was the ticket. So I decided I want to go. So I worked one year uh, at a grocery store, packing, unpacking. And I saved a few hundred dollars. I had, I had a little bar mitzvah money. And, okay, I come home from yeshiva one day, and I tell my mother, <coughs> oh, Shalom, may she forgive me. Uh, I want to go to Eretz Shel this summer. I was 16 and change. Oh, sure, why not? I said, well, my grandfather worked. He said, your grandfather worked his whole life. He's in pension now. He went retired. So he took a trip to Eretz Shell. You? <coughs> Nobody else in the family was there in Eretz Shell at the time. He said, you want to go? I said, yeah. Why? I want the mitzvah of walking in Eretz Shell. Right. You can imagine how good that would have gone over in the United Nations too. Right? That's how well it went over in my house. <laughs> so whatever. So we started, and it went on for about a month. About a month. I had a battle every day back and forth. I have the money, it's my money, I can do what I want, back and forth. Came a point, it was like June, early June, I needed the money the next day. I still didn't have a penny. So I said, on the way home from Yeshiva that night, I said, Hashem, I feel I'm getting the money tonight. I have to go. I have to go to Eretz, sir. 
So uh, I come home, and I had my mother, and my grandfather, all of us all, and a few sets of aunts and uncles. They all came over to the house because I said I need the money by a certain day, whatever. And uh, I need the money. So they were all there to greet me. I sat in the couch. They put me down on the couch in the corner, and they all sat around me. You know, like I said, Hedger used to sit like a half circle, whatever. <laughs> they sat around me like that. Okay, what's this? What's that? What's that? This. And this went on for about a half hour, back and forth. So I said, Hashem, this is going nowhere. I need the money. I got to go there. It's hell. So I said, Hashem, I want to cry. I sat there on the couch. They're talking to me. And I said, Hashem, I want to cry. And I sat there saying this five, seven minutes, whatever it was. Hashem, I want to cry. And I started crying. When I started crying, I said, Hashem, the Gemara says, blackmail they call it, right? The Gemara says, the gates of prayer may be closed. Shari tefila ninalu. But shari tmo is loyinam. The gates of tears are never closed. I says, I'm crying. I want to go to Eretz Yisrael. I'm crying. I want to go to Eretz Yisrael. They're talking to me. It's like talking to the wall. I'm talking to Hashem. That's the right way to do things. Um, five, ten minutes later, I had my ticket. I had to check for my ticket. And, you know, you want something. I learned a good lesson over the years. I didn't do it all of my life. I should have. I learned a lesson. But if you're diving for something that you really want, you get it to. You get it to. And this is what Eretz Yisrael means. Eretz Yisrael, Rabbi Nachman says in Lesson 7, is the land of tefillah. It's the land of tefillah. Because Emuna and tefillah are the same. Eretz Yisrael is the land of Emuna. Shchoin Eretz Urei Emuna, Apostle in Tilum 37. Dwell in the land and pasture yourself. Grow with Emuna. Emuna is tefillah, because if you believe, you pray. If not, not. Moshe Rabbeinu, when he had to pray against Amalek, Vahi Yodav Emuna, his hands were faithful, right? What does the Targum say? Rashi brings it. Prishim Bitzloi, they were spread out in tefillah. Emuna is tefillah. If a person were to pray to Hashem, put your koiches, Hashem, let Eretz Yisrael live, let Am Yisrael live. The Arabs, look how, how murderous they are. You can say that, because it's true. You're not trying to chan for Hashem. You're not trying to flatter Hashem. The Hashem, look, take a look. The Arabs, wherever they go, they cause damage. Wherever they go, they kill. Wherever, it doesn't matter. If they're in Saudi Arabia, if they're in Syria, look at Syria. Look at they killing each other in Syria. Right? Look at Iraq. Look at Yemen. Look at Libya. Look at Egypt. Look at all the countries where the Arabs live. They kill each other. He says, what does Am Yisrael do? Wherever the Jew goes, he builds. That's the legacy of Am Yisrael. The legacy of Ki Yedativ, Hashem said to Avram Avinu, Ki Yitzave Ezbonav Ezbeso Yacharov, he's going to command his people, Lishmo Derech Hashem, lastly, Tztoko Mishpat, to watch the path of Hashem, to do Tztoko and Mishpat, who does Tztoko, like Am Yisrael. Right? I traveled around the States a lot of times when I started, first started collecting for Stucco for the organization. Right? Every city I went to, there's the Beth Israel Hospital, the Beth Zion Hospital, right? Mount Sinai Hospital. Right? The, every said they were 100 years old, these hospitals. Denver Children's Hospital, right? the Jewish Hospital in Denver, something like that. All over the world, wherever the Jews went, they built, they built hospitals, they built yeshivas, they built schools, they built education. Wherever the Jew goes, he builds. That's a Jew. That's what, it, look at Eretz Yisrael, the way it was 60 years, 50 years ago when I was here. Yeshiva Bayat Vagan. You know the neighborhood Bayat Vagan? Right? Nice neighborhood. It was outside Yerushalayim, really. Not really, but it was, it was part of Yerushalayim, but it was considered outside. From Beit HaKerim to Bayat Vagan, there was nothing. Nothing. Just empty lots, empty land. They held the first day poor. Huh? Back then they held the first day poor. The first day poor. Buy it for gun. 
Today, it's in the center of the town, in the middle, right? Built over, past Gilo, Katamon, all the way down here. Right? Eric Shelton built. Look at this, there's no land, right? There's no room to move, but they're building. <laughs> wherever they go, they're building. Take a look out, in the, wherever you go, in the Shtachim, wherever you go, in the, anywhere, anywhere, in the Galil, wherever you go, in the building, a Jew built. Look at the high tech that comes out of Eretz Yisrael. Look what they do with this. They distinct waves about the, the direction on the phone, whatever. You know, a GPS on the phone, it does everything, right? Amazing. It's a Jewish guy. They have this thing with the buses, you know, the schedule when the bus is coming. It's a Jewish guy. It's Israelis. Right? There's a guy, Get Taxi. Right? Wherever you are. In New York City, they have it. Get Taxi. It's Israeli. It's Jewish brains. It's Wherever we go, Rabbi Sai, we build. A Jew builds. That's the legacy of Avram Avinu. You see it here, coming alive before your eyes in Eretz Yisrael. You see how the country is building, despite the fact that we have a Knesset, right? <laughs> you have it. It's amazing what's going on. This is what Hashem promised Am Yisrael. This is what Hashem gave us. We can do it. The Arabs fight this, the Arabs fight that. Our weapon is not a machine gun, because you see it doesn't help anyway. They have a war a few years ago with Lebanon, and the rockets were falling, you couldn't do anything. They couldn't do anything to stop it. It didn't work. Right? What can work is tefillah. Tefillah, emunah. Do we believe the land is ours? I believe it. Right? Every Jew has a chalik in Eretz Yisrael. Every Jew. Religious, not religious, whoever he is. Every Jew has a part in Eretz Yisrael. Right? They should all come. They should all come. You can encourage somebody to come too, whatever. Point is, that you had a case, uh, a guy from Chicago, I was there last year. Guy uh, retired, he wants to move to Eretz. So he spoke to me about different places, I helped him uh, with different places he might be able to live. Okay, fine. He calls me up a couple of weeks ago. He moved to Eretz Israel. A week or two later, they found the growth in his brain. All right? growth in his brain. He had to go back to Chicago. His kids were there. They helped take care of him. He had the operations and the chemo and the radiation and all. Finished. So he calls me up. I just finished everything now. What should I do? I have the hospitals here. I have my children here. I would. I want to live in Eretz Israel. That's what he asked me. So I said to him, let's take it from the top. If you're going to live, Be'ez HaShem, you're going to have life, it'll work out, everything was okay, right? So where's the best place to live? Eretz Yisrael. So is there a question in your mind that you should move to Eretz Yisrael? Right? And let's look at it the other side of the coin. If you're not going to live, you won't survive this thing, you're going to be buried. Where do you want to be buried? Eretz Yisrael. So you may as well come back. <laughs> right? <laughs> you help the guy, you come back. Either way, you're looking, you can't lose, right? The only thing I would suggest, you just finished now, wait a few months till Pesach, you know, to see how everything is developing. And if from now till Pesach, everything is okay, so then come back after Pesach, whatever. But the way you look at it is there it showed the place for me. Right? right? On the other hand, Chazal Havak Poda. They were kind of rough on people that uh, they died in Eretz Israel. They wanted to be buried in Eretz Israel. They died in Chutzlars. They wanted to be buried in Eretz Israel. Buried at the Ksuvas, Yerushalmi, the Midrashim. Right? Why? The Pasuk says, Vatuvoyu, Vatatamu is Artsi. You come and you make impure my land. My land is land, whatever it is. You are impure. You're a dead body. And you want to bring the dead, the impure, back to Eretz Yisrael? Still, the Gemara says, when they bury the guy, they put earth of Eretz Yisrael on him. The keeper at Mosai Amli. The earth of Eretz Yisrael brings a kapara. Right? And you have to know that that happens even now when we're alive. The keeper at Mosai Amli. It's Gemara in Suvis. The Gemara says, Kol Ashari Eretz Yisrael, Shari Beloichet. Right? Whoever lives in Eretz Yisrael is without sin. Right? I mean, Let's be a little uh, uh, practical about that, whatever is really going on and all that kind of stuff. 
But the fact remains that the koyach of Eretz Yisrael, if a person wants to serve Hashem, then Eretz Yisrael brings a kapara for the person too. If you want. If you want Eretz Yisrael. All right? So our job, our mission, if you wish to accept it, right, is to recognize that every Jew is important in Hashem's, name, in Hashem's eyes. And that's what Rabbi Nachman teaches, that Eretz Yisrael, it's called Eretz Yisrael because of the Jew. It's the Jew who makes it Eretz Yisrael. We, by acting like a Jew, by being Shabbat Torah or Mitzvahs, by being Shabbat Shabbos, by watching Tumas and Maestras, Shemitah, whatever it is, not so easy Shemitah in some places, whatever. But whatever we do, we try to live like a Jew, we are making the Kedusha Eretz Yisrael. We are drawing that Kedusha of Hashem down to Eretz Yisrael. All right, understanding it Kabbalistically, Eretz is Malchus, the lowest of the levels. It's Tefillah, it's Emunah. All right, the Jew, Yisrael, Yaakov, right, Yisrael is Teferis. It's a higher level. It's what gives the Koyach into Malchus. If you want the Malchus of Am Yisrael to come out, if you want to show that the Jew is really a human being, but a real human being, if you want to show that Eretz Yisrael really belongs to the Jews, and we are the people who can bring out the Kedusha of Eretz Yisrael, then all you have to do is act like a Jew. Daven, learn, do the mitzvahs the best we can. If you have somebody who wants to share it with you, share it with them. Why not? Right? Just speak about the Kedusha of Eretz Yisrael. This is the place to be. And if a person is zoicher to that, then he will be zoicher to feel the Kedusha of Eretz Yisrael. Right? I came here once with my father, <coughs> Rosenfeld. We were on the taxi going from Ben Gurion Airport to Yerushalayim. I think the first time, maybe the second time I was here. But he was looking out the window and he says, just believe every pebble, every blade of grass has Kedusha. Believe it. And you'll see that you're in a different world. You believe it, you'll be able to see that you're in a different world. And it is Eretz Yisrael, right? And we have an opportunity here to come close to Hashem, to feel Hashem, to experience Hashem. Something that's not as available. I mean, you feel bad one morning, you have trouble in the house, whatever. Uh, I got to go to the coastal today. You can do it from here, right? You're in New York. It won't happen even if you get on a plane right then. Until you get here. It's the next day already. So what happens is we have the opportunity of davening. Even where we are, we don't have to run to Yerushalayim. You know. We don't have to run to the person, but we have to daven. We have to daven and daven and daven. And those are the powers that we have. Right? The honesty, deal honestly in business. Right? Because honesty means faithfulness, faith. It means increasing our emuna. Right? All these things are what bring us to Eretz Yisrael. And if we have that, then we'll be able to attack a field Kedusha's Eretz. And we'll be able to show the world, the Emes, that Hashem is Melech al Kol Eretz. This land and every land will understand that the land actually belongs to us. It actually is our land. The Arabs have no place here whatsoever, all right, except if we need them as servants. That's already a different story. But I don't know if I would want an Arab to be my servant. <laughs> That's a different story also. All right, there's a Gemara in Shabbos. Whoever fulfills the mitzvah of tzitzis in the future will have 2,800 servants. All right? All right, okay, I hope I'm fulfilling the mitzvah. So what am I going to do with 2,800 servants? All right? What am I going to do with them? Right, imagine in my apartment, I got five rooms or four rooms, whatever I got. I'm going to do 2,800. What do I need for? Right? right? And Hogar is our original servant. Right? You never find in the Torah that Hogar was dismissed as a maid. She was a maid, but she wasn't given her get Peturin. Right? The get Shikhar, as it's called. Right? 
So Yishmael is still my servant. Right? You look kind of servant. I don't want a guy like that. Right? What are you do with him? Right? Just the smell alone is enough to. <laughs> but whatever the case is, you have all these things that are happening. It's all ours for the asking. Right? You can't do all the mitzvahs Hashem if you're not in Eretz Yisrael. So, tzitzis is shayach to Eretz Yisrael too. Right? What we have to do, tzitzis is also miloshim tzitz. To look. Meitzitz menacharakim. He who sees through the holes, right? Through the splits and whatnot. Right? So the mitzvah of tzitzis was to see what Hashem has to offer us. What the offering of Eretz Yisrael is, it's, uh, it's amazing. Right, the Gemara tells the time of Shimon Mitshetach. This is the early years of the uh, Tanoim. It's like 150 years into the second base of Mikdash. 200 years. He says, the uh, kernels of wheat, the kernel of wheat was as large as the kidney of an ox. That's a kernel of wheat. Right? The grapes, Right? We're this big. The Raglu, they brought back grapes. The fruits of Eretz, it's, it's all waiting for us. It's coming out, it's coming better, it's coming more. Up to us, Rabbi Sam, it's up to us. Any questions? So should we go for? Huh? Who should we go for? Hashem and Moshe Rabbeinu and Rabbi Amela. And you said the time. That's who I would vote for. If I went to the polls, I would vote. When I was 21, that's when the uh, voting age was in America. At that time, you had to be 21. Now it's 18. But at that time, this was 68. And the first election was that I had to go to was Nixon and Humphrey, 68. I went to the polls. The next year was for the governor of New York. I went to the polls. With him for the mayor of New York. The next year was for the governor of New York, 1970. That was the last time I went to the polls. I still lived in America at the time. I couldn't go to the polls anymore. Somebody asked me why. I said, I walk into the booth and I have a pile of dung and a pile of dung and a pile of dung. Which dung do I like best? That's exactly the way I felt. I still feel that I told my family to vote. They should, whatever. I can't do it. I can't walk into a poll, uh, into a booth, and then choose. I can't. I consider all politicians tourists, my Lord. Right? I consider all of them. They're all of the same. I don't care who they are. Religious party, not religious party. This guy. Uh, they're all that. You can't be a politician and be honest. So I just can't do it. That's my own opinion. I'm not telling anyone here not to vote. I'm not telling you to vote. I would like to be like Satma. Satma used to pay $100 to anyone who gave them the Tudan Sehut so they shouldn't be able to vote. That I would like, you know, rake it in, you know, but it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> if, if we're in Golis Edom today, why is it that we're mainly oppressed by Yishmuel? Like the Medrash tells us that all the Golis, all of them, were doubled. Bavel, Daniel, lived in what's called Elam Hamadina. Elam. Elam was part of Bavel at the beginning, and then it became its own country. And the Jews were relegated to living under Elam. So it's Bavel and Elam. The next guy we know about is Haman, Paras Umwadai, Persia and Media, right? The ones after that were Alexander Mukdam, he was Greek but he represented Macedonia, or Macedonia, whatever. I never remember how you're supposed to pronounce it. Right? Huh? And then, this Golos is called Golos Edoin. It's also called Golos Yishmoel. It's also called Golos Yishmoel. That's what the major says. The Zoya, the Pasha Shmois, tells us, Ein l'cha Golos Kosher k'moi Golos Yishmoel. There is no more severe exile than that of Yishmael. Now, if you ask me, 
He challenged me, first of all, in Bovel, the Gemara says in Shabbos, all the years of Nebuchadnezzar, which were 40 years that he ruled, nobody ever smiled. Right? Now, I saw that in communist Russia when I was there in 65, 68, and so on. Right? The communists ruled it tough. Right? If you walked around the streets, you never saw anyone smile. It was like that, Nebuchadnezzar, all over the world, nobody smiled. <laughs> you go into Golis Edoin, uh, I don't believe the church was very nice to us over the years. Right? Before, the, even before the, um, the uh, Crusades, in the 700s already, the, the Moors, and that, they were all killing the Jews there, in Spain and other places like that. Then they had the Crusades, where the church was losing its power. So they declared a holy war against the Arabs. How do we allow the infidel Muslim to rule the Holy Land? So they traveled through Europe, killing hundreds of thousands of Jews. This is the church. They're fighting with the Arabs, so they have to kill us. You had the Khmelnytsky massacres. You had the bloodlight bells. You had the pogroms of the church, you know, in the Eastern Europe and whatnot. And of course you had the Holocaust. So how could you say that the Golas of Yishmoel is worse than the Golas of Edwin? But the Zoya says it. Right? The only thing I could think of is that, well, the guy you knew this was going to happen. In Europe, you knew it was going to happen. They would go to church Sunday morning, they would confess all the sins for the week, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned, and whatnot. They go home, eat lunch, and get drunk, in the afternoon they would make a pogrom. This was kind of like every Sunday afternoon in Europe. It was more or less common knowledge. So you knew more or less what to do to protect yourself. Every so often they'd rise up and cause these murders and whatnot. It happened before in Jewish history, it's going to happen. At that time, you would look at it and say, it's going to happen again. We hope it doesn't anymore. With the Arabs, <clears throat> there's absolutely no predictability. None whatsoever. Who would think of taking a tractor and driving it into a bus in Jerusalem to kill somebody? Just the intent of killing. Who would think of going on a bus between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and go over to the driver take the wheel and turn the bus into a gully so you kill the people, right? Anything the Arabs, who would think of training for two years to learn to fly a plane so you can fly into the World Trade Center and kill as many people as possible? Who would think of that, right? The guy in Europe, you knew more or less the way they thought. These guys, there's no way you can predict what they're doing. Nothing. There's no predictability at all with anything that they're going to do. And that's why the Golas of Yishmoel is the worst of all. That's what I think. And the fact is, the Gemara says that Yishmoel will be mispashed over the world for nine months, I think it is, Gemara St. Hedron, that uh, they will rule over the entire world for nine months and whatnot. You see it happening. I mean, in an Arab box, and the whole world goes crazy. All right? We're not going to let the... Uh, this happened, we're not going to, and they can do whatever they want. All right, there was a famous movie, Is Paris Burning? I never saw it, because I didn't care about the French. But Is Paris Burning? All right? Well, a few years ago, the Arabs burned down Paris. Did anyone care? The Arabs, did, did the French do anything? No. All right? And so on. Yishmoel is the worst, but he's the last of the Klippas. And Rabinosan explains why. According to the, uh, the Zoya, the Arim, we know there are three evil Klippas. Onangodi Cheskel, when he saw the chariot of Hashem, the Merkava, Onangodol, Eruach Zara, Onangodol, Vieshem Shlakachas, a storm wind, a deep dark cloud, and a fire. And then there was a Noga that was around it. A Noga glow was surrounding it. The three evil Klippos are Edom. That's Asa, that's Edom. Yishmoel is represented by Noga. There's a little bit of good in him, 
because he was Gamalit, he took the Mila. In fact, the Zoya says the reason he has any chalik in Eretz Israel today is because of the Mila that the original Yishmoel had. All right, if you want, we'll go into that. The Zoya says that uh, they, they were crying, bemoaning the fact that Yishmoel, that Sarah didn't have a child, so that Avram took Hogar as a mid- as a wife, and she bore him Yishmoel. So the Zoya says, woe to that time that Sarah didn't have, that Yishmoel came into the house. Why? Because Yishmoel eventually had a bris milah. This is the power of the bris milah, which in our terms uh, speaks about morality. You know, not, not playing around, but morality. So because he had the bris milah, we suffer today, and we will suffer till Mashiach comes. Why is that? Because for 400 years, the angel of, Ma- of Yishmoel stood before the Bezdin Shamala and said, why do you take Yitzchak and reject Yishmoel? Why? Hashem said, because Yitzchak has the bris. Yishmoel also had a bris. But Yishmoel didn't have the full bris. Yishmoel didn't have the mitzvah of Priya. He didn't do Priya, only Mila. Right? And he didn't do it with the Shem Shemayim. He did it because his father did it, whatever. Yitzchak, you could say the same thing. He was a kid, but Yitzchak grew up and gave his whole life. So you can't you say that about Yitzchak. <coughs> so for 400 years, the angel of Yishmoel was arguing, <coughs> protesting to the Bezdin Shemayla until Hashem said, okay, he wants a chedek in the Kedusha, he can have a chedek in the Kedusha. Hashem pushed away Yishmoel from the Kedusha of heaven, and he gave him Kedusha in this world, which is the land of Israel. But just like the, his bris was done, Rekanya, it was without any Lishma, without any intent to do a mitzvah, so too he will be given the land when it's empty of the Jews. Because his mitzvah was done empty, so then his reward of the Kedusha will be when Eretz trail is empty. And that means that if you look at history, after the Jews were kicked out of Eretz Israel the second time, Yishmoel then was, I mean, they were nothing. They were nomads, what not. <coughs> Came along uh, Muhammad, whatever his name was, right? And uh, the Arabs became something in the world, whatever. I mean, it's an amazing religion. You have to think about it. How did Islam spread? Violence. Huh? Violence. By the sword, right? Guy would go over, he's a believer. Do you believe in Muhammad? Yes. Okay. You believe in Muhammad? No. That's it. <laughs> no more opposition. That's how, uh, that's how, in a couple of years, a couple of years, Mamish, they took over from the Saudi Arabia to the, uh, to the Atlantic Ocean. How? By the sword. That's how they're, they're, this is what they are. The Arab murderers and whatnot. Point is that Yishmoel is empty of any kind of Kedusha. They're empty of any kind of positive thought. All they do is destroy. Right? The word assassin. You ever hear the word assassin? It comes from the Arabic. Right? After Muhammad, right, they were fighting among themselves. So they came up with these assassins to go around and kill people. <laughs> That's what it is. This is what you're dealing with. That's the Koyach of Yishmoel. And their Koyach in Eretz Israel today is only because they did the mitzvah. He did a mitzvah of bris, Shaloi Lishma. Can you imagine what happens when the Jew does a mitzvah of bris, Lishma? Imagine the greatness, the Kedusha that spread in the world. But you got to get rid of that Klippa Snoiga. You have to get rid of that Klippa that's Yishmoel, who had some good in him because he came from the house of Ram. Right, Ace of two, but Ace of was a whole different book. But Yishmoel represents Chesed, Ace represents the Gvura, the, the evil parts of Chesed and Gvura. When Yishmoel will be Nichna with all his Chesed, his kindness, right, we can raise a Kitrug against them, right? The Quran speaks strongly about giving charity, right? After the 48 war, all the Arabs here were left in refugee camps. They didn't give a penny. 
They only use them for political points, right? So look, Rebani should look how a yid. After the, 40, after the Second World War, the Jews were all over in the DP camps and whatnot. The whole world Jewry that was alive came to help them. And these the guys left their people wallow in mud and dirt and filth and whatnot. The Hashem should help. That we should do the right thing. If we act honestly, we act faithfully, we daven, we have emuna, we'll make it happen. I just wanted, I brought this with me, just a couple of copies. I don't have more than that. This is the 50th gate of Nusson's the Kute Tfilis with an English translation, right? It just came off the press a few hours ago, just before I came out here. It's hot. It's hot. Mamish. So this just came out, if you want. What is it, 45 shekels, I guess? I don't know exactly the price. Right? Right? It's about that, give or take, uh, whatever. It's 50 shekels. 50 is even better, okay. <coughs> okay, so 50. I have three copies here. If anyone wants to buy a copy, Shekel for each case. <laughs> Is anybody interested in Marv? Shekel for each case. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Marv? Yeah. Raise your hand. We have a menu? I can't see. I dive into it. We have a menu? I'd like to go home. I can't see. Is there a menu? No. No? Yeah. Women maybe. Can you raise your hands if you... Can anyone count for me? I can't. I can't see. We have? I count seven. Eight. Eight? Okay, we don't have that. Not only that, but I want to stick around with you. We have seven. I didn't go last night, but I know. Could you give them that? Oh, okay. Who does it? Who does it? Who does it?